Welcome everyone to the 10th meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off their mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. Now we have apologies have been received from uh, Jim Eady, Alec Johnson and Mary Fee this morning. Uh, but we're pleased to have Linda Fabiani with us, who will uh, attend as a substitute for Jim E.D. At uh, Agenda Item 1, the committee will take evidence on the Harbour Scotland Bill from the Minister for Transport and Islands, accompanied by the Bill team. So can I welcome Derek Mackay, Minister for Transport and Islands, Chris Wilcox, Head of Ports and Harbours, Transport Scotland, Pauline McMillan, uh, Policy Manager, Ports and Harbours, Transport Scotland, and Stuart Fubister, Divisional Solicitor, DLS Scottish Government. So the Minister has indicated he doesn't wish to make an opening statement, so we'll, we'll move straight uh, to, to questions. Um, so if I can kick off. Uh, Minister, can you outline what consultation has un been undertaken by the Scottish Government with shipping and port industry stakeholders prior to the introduction of the bill? And if you could, could you uh, outline what the key issues uh, were raised and how did they shape the proposals in the bill? Uh, thank you and good morning, convener uh, and committee. The, uh, there was uh, stakeholder consultations before the bill uh, was launched and consulted upon with the key stakeholder groups such as, such as the British Ports Association, UK Major Ports Group and the Chamber of Shipping. No particular issues were raised but we've got a very clear issue that we want to address. There's an understanding and an acceptance around that and as part of the consultation we've received as part of the uh, bill. Uh, we have general support with some issue around mediation where some stakeholders felt that the legislative elements around uh, mediation may not be required and that could be achieved through non-statutory guidance. But in essence, the bill is supported to achieve what we've set out to achieve. Okay. And, and what, was, what was that? Uh, it's quite clear. We want to give an assurance around uh, trust uh, port model and remove the potential conflict that's been identified by the Office for National Statistics that their review could reclassify certain trust ports as public corporations and that would have an impact for the public purse by way of borrowing that they may undertake being counted as Scottish uh, government uh, borrowing in terms of uh, our finances. So that's uh, unhelpful, not necessary, so we will uh, remove the provisions that we've set out that, that clarifies that matter as best we can and we'll continue to work with the ONS to achieve that. We'll also uh, make, it, uh, make the process more efficient by removing some unnecessary bureaucracy, i.e. the requirement for six copies of draft harder orders to be submitted along with the application for the order. Okay, thank you. Um, can we move on, Dave? Uh, thank you. Um, are there plans to introduce uh, mediation in disputes about harbour dues? And if there is, will that be on a voluntary or statutory basis? We've agreed with the industry that the non-statutory guidance and mediation will be prepared. So I think that will be welcomed by stakeholders. And there are already provisions that we can get engaged in mediation. And maybe people need to be made more aware of the existing provisions. But yes, we're proposing a non-statutory guidance. Thank you. And, and just for the record, um, for the committee, could you outline the main provisions of the Harbour Scotland Bill? Uh, well, I'll ask Chris to give you more of the technical detail, and then you can certainly probe Chris uh, further on that. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Um, Sorry, I thought you meant in, in relation to uh, specifically existing powers around mediation. Is that what you were looking for, yes. Mr Stewart? Yes. Okay. Mediation. Uh, yeah, well, certainly in terms of mediation, uh, at the moment there is a right to appeal to Scottish ministers around harbour dues in the 1964 Act uh, under Section 31, uh, which is a formal appeal to, to ministers on the level of harbour dues that are set. Um, that can be quite a complex process. It is a last resort. Um, and we've not actually had uh, one of those appeals 
uh, brought to us since uh, since devolution. Uh, although there have been examples down south and examples prior to, to devolution. Um, what we were keen to do, though, we, we did have a, an informal approach on a potential um, uh, appeal under this section, uh, and our role was quite limited, uh, given the formal appeal might sit with us, which is why we want to introduce this, this potential mediation stage. Um, but uh, as the Minister has pointed out, when we spoke to the industry about this, <coughs> the, the ports themselves were clear that they actually already undertake a kind of level of local mediation, and that perhaps a non-statutory uh, guidance was the, was the more appropriate route, and, and that's what mm. we will prefer. But I think it, what's important to note is that the formal appeal process under Section 31 will remain in effect as it, as it has been previous. This would just mm. be additional <clears throat> guidance on other measures. And did you pick up uh, a lot of evidence that there um, is regular disputes between users of harbours and the harbours themselves? I mean, do we, do we need this stage? What, what evidence do we it, have for in, re step? in relation to Jews, I, I think, as, as I mentioned, we, we have had some tentative approaches, um, in maybe over the last three years. We've probably had maybe half a dozen people come to us over that period, um, one from a particular uh, sector um, or, or a group from a particular sector. And again, that was actually uh, resolved in discussions between the ports and those users themselves, which from our perspective in Transport Scotland, is that that is actually the best manner to, to, to resolve these, given that rather than have a, uh, ministerial or government involvement, to allow these bodies to kind of uh, build on the relationships moving forward. If these can be resolved locally, that, that's, that's the best means to resolve these. Thank you. And, Convener, my final question is, uh, the policy member Adam states that the primary purpose of the bill is to provide, and I quote, an improved legislative framework for transports across Scotland. Can you explain how it will achieve this aim? Minister? Happy to do that. And to go back to the previous question for Mr Stewart, I think it's important to bear in mind that there may be a, an issue around um, dues and there's also an issue around control, which is a separate matter and a very specific process around harbour revision orders and uh, empowerment orders as well. So that's a separate process where there's maybe a dispute or an interest around control, which has been more controversial than uh, the dues issue. So I think it's worth mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Specifically how the bill progresses our aim is the removal of ministers' power to compel trust ports over the relevant turnover threshold to bring forward privatisation proposals. So the removal of that will remove a level of uncertainty for those po uh, ports affected and also reaffirms our support for the trust model as part of the diverse range of ownership structures in Scotland. And that's how the legal change will bring about the purpose that we're pursuing. Right. Thank you, Computer. Thanks. Um, can we move on? Uh, Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, the policy memorandum states that the bill satisfies a commitment by the Minister for Transport and Veterans to the Office for National Statistics following the review to reclassify certain trust ports as public corporations. Can you explain when this commitment was made, what was committed to, and why you considered it appropriate to make this commitment? Okay, my predecessor, Keith Brown, wrote to the Office of National Statistics on the 5th of September 2013 to advise that Scottish ministers had no intention to exercise the power to require a port to privatise under Section 10 of the Ports Act 1991 and would consider the introduction of legislation to remove it if it would be necessary to avoid ONS classification of trust ports over the relevant threshold as public corporations and following the decision by the ONS on the 25th of September 2013 to retain the classification, the commitment was made by Mr Brown to take forward legislation, uh, which of course is exactly what we are now considering and pursuing. Thank you, Minister. And um, my, my second question is about the, the policy memorandum, which indicates that classification of a trust port as a public corporation could have implications for Scottish Government budgets. Can you outline what these implications might be? Well, essentially, it would mean that the borrowing that a trust port may undertake would count against um, Scottish Government budgets and be deemed as almost our <coughs> borrowing. So that's something of which we have no control uh, and therefore would affect the public purse to a substantial amount. If you take, for example, the very exciting proposals around Aberdeen Harbour, it could be an investment of £300 million and a significant amount of borrowing. And, Therefore, it would have an impact on uh, the Scottish Government's uh, accountancy exercise and potentially our borrowing. So, if this is only a technical matter of bureaucracy and clarification, we want to resolve it so it doesn't have an impact 
on our uh, government's uh, ability to borrow, indeed to spend. Thank you, Minister. I do. Sh I should perhaps just say in passing that I share your enthusiasm for the investment and the improvements that are proposed at Aberdeen. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, moving on, James. Yeah, just say further to that, Minister. Good morning, and thank you, Convener. Uh, the Office of National Statistics offered any guarantee that the passage of the bill will mean that trust ports will not be categorised as public corporations at some point in the future. Uh, the honest answer is they haven't given us a guarantee. Previous discussions that we've had with them suggest <coughs> this should satisfy their needs around uh, classification. But that said, they can't give a cast iron guarantee because of their working practices and the model that they would then run through in terms of the outcome of their decision. And we will, of course, share progress with them. We'll be in contact with them, both the ONS uh, and uh, the Treasury, to ensure that it, uh, it's concluded in a positive way. And if there are any other emerging issues, which there may be around classification, hopefully we can address them. Now, I would hope this would be concluded by stage two of the bill, but that will be in the hands of ONS and potentially Treasury as well. And we will share further information with you if we don't get that uh, assurance that this matter will be resolved. But all the early indications and discussions that we had is that if we legislate and go down this road, um, it, should have, it should remove us from the classification uh, that uh, I've discussed. But if there are other emerging issues, then they'll need to be addressed. Maybe Chris can, can add to that in terms of the most current position. Yeah, I mean, as the Minister outlined, uh, the, I'm sure the committee is aware, Aberdeen was already classified as a public corporation and has been since 2000. Uh, ONS, uh, based on the threshold of their, their turnover, um, ONS also identified um, Lerwick and Peterhead as potentially uh, coming up the, the list on that threshold too, which I think makes it all the more imperative, both the Aberdeen investment that's pending and, and the ongoing investment at the other two ports. Um, when we engaged with ONS, we asked them to, to look at all of the factors that, that led to the original classification in 2000, and they did this across the UK, uh, and there were varying levels of government control across the UK. Within Scotland, uh, in terms of the classification, the key element was this piece uh, of legislation where ministers can, can compel them to, to privatise. Um, we then have gone back to ONS to say, well, if we come up with the, the bill and once they see the detail of this bill, would they be prepared to look at that decision again, which they will do. Um, but it's only at the point that they look at that in detail uh, and possibly all the other factors uh, that, that we'll have a final decision from them. But as the Minister has identified, we'd, we'd work to, 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 to push through anything that, that comes up. Can I just ask further to that then? If, if there was any decision to reclassify by ONS, if there was any decision to reclassify trust ports, uh, how quickly would you think that would be likely to take effect and could any delay impact on any current port development proposals? We would want it to be concluded as quickly as possible. That wouldn't be in our hands, but in the hands of the ONS. And we, we'd want them to pursue it as quickly as possible so we can have this uh, resolved. OK. If, if it didn't, to answer the next part of your question, Mr Dunn, I don't think it would necessarily impact on any trust ports plans, frankly. But if it isn't resolved, it does impact on Scottish Government's accounts. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda, uh, final question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I see that the Finance Committee hasn't carried out any formal consideration of the financial memorandum and that it stated that there would be no uh, costs incurred on government, local authorities, other bodies, individuals or businesses. Is that still the case? Yes, it is. Thank you. OK, um, thanks very much. Those are all the questions we have for you this morning. Minister, is there anything you'd like to add? Nothing further to add. Thank you, convener. OK, thank you very much. That concludes our evidence at stage one of the Harbour Scotland Bill. The committee will consider a draft report on the general principles of the bill at a future meeting. So I'll suspend the, the meeting briefly to allow a witness changeover. Thank you very much.
For, for agenda item two, the uh, committee will take evidence from the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland on its uh, freight, freight transport in Scotland inquiry. And uh, uh, as you can see, the Minister is still with us, as is uh, Chris Wilcock. And can I also uh, welcome Margaret Horn, who is branch head freight policy and inland waterways, and Stephen McMahon, head of rail strategy and, and funding. Good morning. Um, could I invite the Minister to make uh, an opening statement, please? Thank you, Convener. I welcome your work to identify and understand some of the challenges facing the freight transport industry in Scotland. Since 2007, the Scottish Government's purpose has been to create a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth. Our economic strategy identifies the need for leadership of change, partnership working, and focuses on our four priorities – innovation, inclusive growth, investment and internationalisation. Scotland's transport system is a key enabling factor in helping us achieve our purpose and ambitions for economic growth, and we need infrastructure that connects people to jobs, education, services and recreation, and of course to move goods. The Scottish Government's approach to invest in Scotland's transport infrastructure aims to do this by supporting developments that are focused on improving journey times and connectivity, enhancing Scotland's competitiveness, improving accessibility and integration, and minimising the impact of transport on the environment. Transport Scotland manages and maintains the 2,000-mile trunk road and motorway network, which connects Scotland's major cities, towns, airports and ports. We plan and deliver rail policy, strategy and investment, advising on rail investment decisions and provide the specification of railway outputs that we wish to buy. Development of rail freight terminals and associated sidings is a matter for the commercial freight sector. We are responsible for legislation, policy and guidance relating to ferry services, ports, harbours and canals in Scotland, and shipping is, of course, a reserved matter, as indeed road freight regulation. I understand that road freight will remain the predominant mode for the movement of goods in Scotland for reasons of volume or geography. I also recognise the adverse impact of freight movements on the environment, so we encourage modal shift from road to less environmentally damaging modes where feasible. We do so through our mode shift grant schemes, which provide a financial contribution towards private sector projects. Ultimately, however, decisions on the means of transport for goods are a matter for the commercial sector. The Strategic Transport Project Review provides the evidence base for the Infrastructure Investment Plan, and since 2007 we have invested more than £6 billion on our trunk roads and have a £3.5 billion capital investment programme and rail for the next five years. The SDPR identified facilitating freight routes as one of the primary functions for the National Strategic Transport Network, so the projects we are taking forward will improve the movement of goods. Roads projects such as the Queensferry Crossing, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and the duelling of the A9 and the A96 have all been welcomed by stakeholders from the freight sector. On-rail projects are planned to improve the Aberdeen to Inverness line and the Highland Main Line. In addition, we have made available £30 million for the strategic, Scottish Strategic Rail Freight Investment Fund to enable improvement initiatives that encourage growth and productivity in rail freight, reduce emissions and road congestion. This demonstrated commitment to investing in our transport infrastructure will help achieve our vision for Scotland to be a place where the movement of freight through the entire supply chain is efficient and sustainable, so allowing Scotland's businesses to compete and grow in a global economy. However, many of the freight challenges identified by this inquiry cannot be addressed by government investment infrastructure alone. We have to recognise the commercial nature of the freight industry and the competition both within and across modes. We have to identify approaches that achieve public policy aims but are also sustainable from a business perspective. We know this can only be achieved through close partnership working between the public and the private sectors. And the Scottish Government have a well-established vehicle in place to help us to do so. Our stakeholder group set up in 2009, the Scottish Freight and Logistics Advisory Group, Scotflag, ensures ongoing engagement and a collaborative approach between the Scottish Government, the wider public sector and the freight industry. Scotflag's remit is to advise on and monitor delivery of freight policy in Scotland, consider the impact of government policies on freight movements and prioritise and coordinate action taken by the industry and other stakeholders in response to government policies. 
Through our ongoing engagement, we know our freight stakeholders continue to both share our vision and our support, our approach on freight policy in Scotland. And once I receive your recommendations, I will give them careful consideration. Scott Flag will then provide a useful vehicle for discussion with stakeholders on a possible work programme. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Can I invite uh, Linda Fabiani to kick us off with some questions on road Good. matters? Yes, uh, yes, Minister. I understand that during evidence sessions, concerns were raised about the difference in speed limits for HGVs in Scotland compared to England and things like that. So can I ask, first of all, um, about the A9 upgrade? I see it's been welcomed by road hauliers, but of course that has raised the potential for similar upgrades in other parts of the country. Um, can you tell me how you are prioritising such things? I think the A9 right now is uh, a, success, a success story in the extent that the package of measures are having an impact on road safety, uh, journey time, reliability, and as we dual the A9 road, road infrastructure. The reason that we were able to amend the speed limits for HGVs was because of that package of measures. So it's very specific to the A9. And at the moment, I only propose it for the A9, mm -hmm. where the average uh, speed cameras are in place as part of this package of measures, which in the second round of statistics is showing a safer road, um, vastly reduced speeding, uh, drivers, driver behaviours improved, and people feel safer. And for the business community, safer roads have to be a good thing, but of course, uh, better journey time, reliability, actually now even better uh, than we had uh, modelled, and road use on the, the A9 is up as well. And the reason I make that point is some critics may have suggested that people would use other routes to go along the, the A9. Uh, that's not happening. So all the evidence on our package of measures is very reassuring. But, of course, there is a safety record to be addressed uh, on the A9. Uh, the UK government, through the Department for Transport, has increased the speed limits for HGVs. They carried out a consultation, and that consultation that had an appraisal, that that decision to do so south of the border will probably mean a loss of life will probably mean more fatalities and more injuries. Well, that's not a price that I'm willing to take in Scotland for a blanket increase on HGVs. So it was appropriate on the A9 because of the package of measures, but I don't propose a further increase in HGV speed limits as a blanket increase across the country because it's very specific. But we will, of course, pay very close attention to the actual experience south of the border uh, and to how that policy impacts there. But when their own appraisal suggests that people may die as a result of the policy, safety in Scotland is paramount, and that's a gamble I'm not willing to take. Convener, I've got some questions about rail terminals uh, and ports, but I know that my colleague David Stewart's got more on this particular issue. Okay. Uh, right, uh, thank you, Convener. I've got uh, two related points, uh, Minister. First of all, as far as the A9 duelling is concerned, um, obviously as a Highland Islands MSP, I'm very enthusiastic about the duelling. As you know, I've supported uh, that uh, uh, Scottish Government policy. However, when we've taken evidence, particularly from uh, the rail industry and those who are interested in rail issues, there is the issue about modal shift. And clearly, if you have um, an increase in terms of duelling, but, but you're not... Uh, reforming rail as quickly, there is a real problem you won't get this modal shift. And uh, as you would probably expect, um, I could give you four or five things which uh, I personally uh, think would make a big difference. Uh, first of all, clearly speeding up. I know you have plans for electrification, but clearly speeding electrification uh, for uh, Tunbrunness and Aberdeen is crucial. Uh, certainly looking at dueling stroke, having more passing places, passing loops for rail is crucial. You know in a recent question I asked you about what percentage of the line um, is single track on memory, and I haven't got that in front of me, I think it's around 90% is single track if you go north of Perth. So clearly there's real issues about how you manage rail, and clearly upgrading uh, signals and are allowing uh, the removal of height restrictions for freight. All these packages would make rail more attractive. So I want to see modal shift, but I really worry that unless we have accelerated expenditure on rail at the same time, that rail will be seen as the poor relation compared to roads. So I'd le I'll, I'll leave that question with you first before my second uh, question. I, I understand uh, the rationale behind Mr Stewart's uh, question, and I think that's 
all the more reason to op oppose austerity. And the, the, the Scottish Government has an alternative to austerity, which means real terms increases in spending. Then we could do even more on infrastructure spend, as this Government has laid out and the Labour Party, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party have all opposed with your plans for further spending cuts. So I agree with Mr Stewart. We could do more if we had the resources to do more on road and rail, and people will have that choice in about eight days' time if they would like to do what Mr Stewart suggests we, we should do. But if you forgive that slightly partisan point, but you did invite it, um, I would disagree that we've prioritised uh, road over rail, because actually the multi-billion pound spend in both is substantial. And yeah. I also don't think that for a minute you would be suggesting that we slowed down the no. investment no. Uh, in the duelling of the, the A9 because it makes the, the A9 more attractive than, than rail. No. I, I would disagree no. with that. The, the works on the A9 in terms of the duelling is, is required for the reasons I've given earlier around road safety and investment and encouraging economic growth and connections across our cities and our towns. <clears throat> but so too investment is required in the Highland uh, main line. Now, some works are committed and we would like to go further in the control period. We're actively considering <clears throat> issues such as the electrification strategy at the moment, as Mr Stewart is uh, uh, well aware. But it is the case that we support modal shift. But our infrastructure spend it is considered in a, a range of uh, strategic ways and using the methodology, like stag appraisals that you would um, expect. And in terms of the smaller technical matters, uh, they will be considered by the rail industry in terms of how we can improve journey times and support mm -hmm. freight. But the big question around infrastructure spend, we can only unlock those extra resources to do much more if we have access to, to greater spending capacity, indeed borrowing along the lines that this government has uh, suggested. But I'm sure, once again, you would welcome the duelling work on the A9. The first government to commit to duel uh, that route and, of course, to connect all our cities in a way that would be uh, befitting of this century. Mm. If I could brief it. Um, I thank the Minister for his comments. Um, I, I won't take the bait that he very cleverly tries uh, for me to, to accept here. The basic point I'm making is that the A9 duelling is something I would welcome, I'm sure my party would welcome. I merely make the point that if you look at the relative spend on rail and road in that particular route, clearly road expenditure dwarfs that of rail. I merely make the point if you have expenditure at the same level on road and rail, you make the opportunity to take rail as a modal shift choice in a much more realistic and logical way. Speed is still a real problem on that route. And I really make the point that comparative expenditure is crucially important. The other one I'd like just to raise with you, you know I've raised this before, is about, about the speed limit increases. You know that I campaigned and welcomed that. It came from a <coughs> um, local lorry driver, Conor McKenna. Uh, it was a real grassroots campaign uh, from hundreds of local drivers. I, I clearly support that. I know you have to look at evidence. Um, I, won't, I do think the England and Wales experiment was, uh, or issue was quite interesting. Uh, I merely make the point, will the Scottish Government keep their policy minds open about that speed limit being increased for the whole of Scotland if the evidence from the A9 speed cameras justifies it? I think that's quite a complex question to, to start on, on the last question. Of course, government will always keep an open mind. It would be a foolish government to be closed-minded based on evidence, and we'll take an evidence-based approach. Mm. But in the UK government's own consultation, it predicts an increase in fatalities and an increase in incidents as you speed up the traffic of HGVs. Mm. Now, I'm learning from that their own appraisal and the expertise and the experience we have in Scotland and road safety campaigners who have encouraged us not to have a blanket increase but to take a more sophisticated approach. So the balance of measures, the package of measures, seems to have been working on the A9. Of course, the average speed cameras uh, are in place there, which is part of the package. And the context of David Stewart's mm. question was to say if average speed cameras were deployed elsewhere with a package of measures, could you consider increasing the HGV speed limit there? Well, yes, we could. But you entirely get the point. It will be evidence-based. It will be taken in the context of the package of measures rather than a blanket increase, as is the case south eh, of the border. If I can go back to your first point um, around duelling of the A9, every time I go into the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament, the demands are made from all sides. Can we accelerate 
the spending on the duelling of the A9, which is a £3 billion project. This must mm. be the first time I've been told, can you slow it down for something else to happen? No, no, now, I, don't, no, I know you don't no, quite no. mean it like that, no, no, but no. the reality is we don't have yeah. another £3 Conven billion pounds to Con spend convenient if you don't right mind. now. I, I mean, I know we have an election next on week, but it's, it's no, grossly unfair of the Minister to suggest that. I have said I support the duelling of the A9. At no time have I said today, and the official record will show that, well, it's very so, easy. At no time did I say that. It's and I'd like very to make, easy. No, I would like to make that quite clear, Convener. The Minister is a very reasonable man, I have to say, but he's not <laughs> reasonable on that point. Okay, then you. I shall try and be reasonable. It's very uh, easy in opposition uh, to support a project and then demand more. Well, we are a few days away from not just demanding more, but making a case for extra uh, resources for infrastructure spend, where we can actually realise the things that you want to uh, comment about, Mr Stewart. I make the point again, I make no apologies for the substantial investment in the A9. If we have more resources, we can do more uh, around road and rail. But to underplay the massive investment in rail, um, I think, is a mistake. The new franchise uh, agreement we've got will mean new trains, it will mean further electrification, improved stations, it will mean improved journey times, better transport experience, greater integration of transport and the Scottish Government will continue to invest in infrastructure such as new railways as well as the improvements on the Highland Main Line, which is the context of your question. So I simply don't accept the premise that prioritising spend for the A9 and duelling the A9, which is long overdue, is to the detriment of freight policy no, in Scotland, which is the basic that. tenant of what David Stewart was trying to suggest. Well, we'll come on to real issues uh, a wee bit later on in this session, but I think Mike McKenzie had a, a supplementary with regards to the <coughs> yep, A9. The, thank you, uh, Convener. And uh, on the issue of the, the idea of comprehensively increasing HGV speed limits, I wonder if the Minister agrees with me that the case on a lot of the West Highland um, road network is quite a different one. Um, I can reflect on my own experience where on my journey home, when I go home, which is fairly infrequent, um, that I, I, I manage an average speed typically of 27 miles per hour, and that's over consistently over the last four years. And the, 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 the reason is often that uh, the, the, the uh, cars are slowed by HGV vehicles, particularly on hills and on bendy parts of the roads and the opportunities for overtaking them and doing so safely within the 60 mile an hour speed limit are actually quite few. And uh, therefore, my experience and that of a lot of uh, my constituents suggests that increasing the speed limit on those roads for HGV vehicles would necessarily reduce the opportunities for overtaking these vehicles safely. And I think what the Minister suggests that that would lead to deaths is a very real proposition. So I'm very glad that he's taken a precautionary approach to this and an evidence-based approach. But I wonder if he does agree with me that all roads have to be looked at carefully on their own merits. Yes, I think Mike McKenzie is absolutely right. And I've had close engagement with the member on specific uh, speed limits on specific roads. And it was another example of where the government, through our agencies, was able to consult, listen to local communities and change our proposals in light of what we've been told on expertise and local opinion. And that local knowledge was very helpful. So I think in that sense, Mike McKenzie is absolutely right. And actually, equally, David Stewart is also a reasonable man, I have to say, and his record on road safety is particularly strong as an informed some of our work as well. So it will be a balanced approach. It will be based in evidence and it will be reasonable. And of course, the economy is important, but safety has to be paramount. Okay, thank you, Minister. Back to Linda. Ah, uh, yes. Sir. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, during the inquiry, there were issues raised about the importance of good road links to ports and rail hubs. So if I could uh, outline some of these issues for you for response, please, Minister. Um, there was particular mention of potential upgrades, um, for example, the Avon Gorge to Grangemouth and the A77 and A75 to Cairn Ryan. Um, could you tell me how you're managing this issue and whether you're in discussion with ports um, in regard to any future capital upgrades? And also, in terms of ports and rail hubs served by both trunk and local roads, 
uh, Freightliner Coat Bridge would be one of those. Um, are there opportunities to work more closely with local authorities to manage that provision more proactively? Um, particularly, I understand, in relation to last mile infrastructure is a concern. Okay, that's, that's quite a, a complex uh, question. There's, there's, a, there's a lot in it. Um, I think Linda Fabiani is right to identify the last mile concept, of course, about the, the connections from, say, hubs or ports to, to, to the strategic route. So we'll, we'll, we're looking very uh, closely uh, at that. And that's largely a local issue as well. And that's why partnerships with transport partnerships is so important and local authorities as well as the largely the, the private sector uh, operators. So there's the government strategic transport uh, projects, uh, the infrastructure and investment plans. There's new deals coming forward for infrastructure, say around the city deals, Glasgow's and the Glasgow area, Glasgow Clay Valley is the most uh, advanced. And there are other government routes, financial innovation, say through tax incremental finance, that picks up an area like Falkirk or or Grangemouth, as well as the wider investment strategies that we have. And in terms of working with local authorities, addressing the most local uh, need, there will also be the roads collaboration that I'm working with COSLA and local authorities on and how we can work better on road infrastructure and addressing the, uh, the backlog of repairs that we've inherited and, and look to the future and better operating as well. So between the investment plans, that local connection, the transport partnerships and other partnerships that we've got, there are a range of ways to try and unlock local economic potential and address the gaps that may be presented between the big strategic points and other parts of the transport network. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. I could outline more specific details on the individual areas that you've requested, if you would like that in writing, rather than give yeah. you detail blow by blow capital yeah. spending commitments on the areas that you've identified, because I'm sure that that would trigger another member's minds there, uh -huh. in local areas. Yeah, that would be useful. I'm just wondering in what you, you've responded there, Minister, whether um, there, there is active cooperation going on with local authorities uh, and Scottish Government at the moment in relation to some of the potential measures you've outlined? I think there is at the high level. So if you take uh -huh. roads co collaboration, there is a national partnership between the roads authorities uh, and Scottish Government or on individual, whether it's enterprise areas or, right. or business proposals, engagement through Scottish enterprise or indeed Highlands and Islands enterprise. But I tell you what I want to get better. I think there is an issue around transport governance in our country that right. sometimes people aren't clear who's responsible for a specific mm -hmm. element of transport, um, I would argue. And for that reason, I intend to refresh the National Transport Strategy. I announced it yesterday at the um, transport uh, conference I was speaking at. So I think there is an issue about bringing partners even closer together and at the most local level, because we're all familiar with community planning, but it sometimes overlooks transport in terms of community planning. So as well as the other um, fora that I've described and investment plans that are in place, I think there is room for uh, further partnership uh, working at the most local level, uh, in addition to the, uh, the, the, the layers of governance that are there. We should make it work, work better. If you design a transport structure, I don't think you design it, or local authorities the way they are right now, if you're starting from scratch. So I think we can mm -hmm. fuse some of this uh, together a bit better. But in terms of the areas you've touched upon, I'm happy to, to write back on the individual areas of concern and some of the investment proposals we have around that. As I say, some of it will be tax incremental finance, some of it might be city deal, some of it might be the traditional capital spending uh, commitments is already um, outlined, and some of it might be local authorities' um, own uh, capital spending plans. So it's, it's a, quite a complicated mix. But that's to be welcomed, is it not? Because it's all stimulating infrastructure spend and economic growth. Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. I think that will be welcomed generally. I certainly will. I uh, we'll look forward to, to getting that material from you, Minister. Can, can we move now from, from roads to rail? That seems a popular option. Um, James. Thank you, Convener. The committee visited some rail terminals during the course of the inquiry. Uh, is the Scottish Government happy with the current quantity and quality of rail hub provision, and how is it ensuring capacity is secure for future growth? I think that there, um, if, if there is 
it's hard to say, you know, is, is the government happy? I think we're content. Is, would you accept that um, terminology? <laughs> it looks uh, like the best I'm getting from you, Minister. Uh -huh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, being from the west of Scotland, if I say something's no bad, that's about as good as it gets. I would have accepted that in a heartbeat. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but where there's, where, where there's further bids for improvement, um, of course we'll welcome that. I, I had the privilege of leading the uh, governments and therefore the countries. Um, national planning framework and we identified a whole host of new opportunities that were emerging in our country around infrastructure and some of it was looking to, to, to rail and coastal um, and port developments as well so of course we'll do everything we can to encourage future uh, development but you know, the more resource we have, the more we can invest in public infrastructure and the more we'll do to stimulate and encourage private sector investment as well because there is that mix in this um, sector between public and private. Okay. Uh, the Scottish government's working with. Net How is the Scottish go government working with Network Rail to ensure that the Scottish Rail Network has the capacity to meet Scotland's trade requirements and prioritise access to global connections? Well, we have very close working, of course, with the rail partners between the operators uh, and uh, Network Rail, and there will be uh, a further uh, degree of uh, devolution as a consequence. All going well from uh, the Smith Commission, subject, of course, to the. Uh, Westminster election and frankly we would pursue even more devolution of rail to Scotland so we can take all the decisions uh, about rail uh, in Scotland but we've got satisfactory uh, engagement processes with network uh, rail but as you know their classification is that although we have a great deal of influence around their spending proposals uh, in Scotland they're not wholly accountable to Scottish Government in the way that they are to UK Government uh, a further reason to have enhanced uh, devolution in terms of the railways to Scotland. But in terms of capacity to meet our uh, aspirations, uh, there is that uh, communication between us with us clarity on what we're trying to achieve. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question, Minister. The committee is aware that the Scottish Government is soon to publish an updated rail freight policy. When is this coming out and will it include links to other modes of transport? The, it's our intention to consult on the refreshed uh, rail freight strategy by September this year and a final copy of the strategy will be published by spring 2016. Of course it will be a strategic document. It will focus on the opportunities for growth potential and the existing rail freight uh, markets as well as developing the new ones and as you would expect I'll of course um, consider very closely the recommendations from this committee as part of that work in addition to the comments I've made to Linda Fabiani about the wider refresh of transport policy, uh, this uh, rail freight refresh uh, will be undertaken this year. OK, right. Thanks, Minister. OK. Uh, moving from, from rail uh, freight to ports, um, one, of, one of the issues that was actually raised with us during the course from, from other witnesses is the fact that, that there's um, this ability to shift between modes and the ability for rail freight to get into ports is uh, there's a big question mark over some of the existing infrastructure in Scotland. Is that on your radar, Minister? I suppose it is. I'd be interested in your conclusions on how that's resolved because some of it's uh, maybe determined by the nature of the the ownership of the ports. There is large as a mix between local authority, trust ports and private sector. So if there's something about the ownership of, of the ports, but you know, if there's commercial interest, then that should unlock the uh, right connections. And I'll look forward to the committee's uh, findings on that. Now, one of the areas is the, is the lack of collaboration and uh, the notion that they're somehow competitive, the different modes are competitive, like the rail companies and, and port authorities. So that is an area. How do you go about actually trying to bang heads together or bring, or bring people around the same table to be a little less violent? Well, I and think to encourage collaboration mm -hmm. across, across the piece. Where we, we, we've clearly tried to focus on modal shift to try and get freight either uh, by sea and river uh, or by rail. So there's infrastructure spend, there's grants for uh, modal shift, and because it's largely, well, it is the private sector, it's their goods that are being transported, then it's largely 
market driven. Mm. Now, government will always be the honest broker in such circumstances, but when it comes to infrastructure development, when we're dealing with the private sector, we have to be very careful about how we use public funds, <coughs> due diligence, and ensure that whatever we're investing in well, has, a, has an economic and social return. But if there are disputes in the private sector, I'm not sure how much we can add to that other than trying to use our economic and regulatory leverage to ensure that people are doing the right things. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, the, 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 continuing on the theme of ports, uh, there's an islander, I'm sure you'll understand, I've got a, an interest in boats and ports, and, and the committee has uh, been lucky enough to visit a few ports during the course of the inquiry, and we learned that there are some um, issues regarding infrastructural and operational limitations. Um, is the Scottish Government happy with the current quality and quantity of port provision in Scotland? Is it no bad or is it better or worse than that? Um, and how, how is the Government working with port operators to ensure that there is capacity, uh, secured capacity for future growth? I should highlight that the terminology of no bad isn't in my civil service briefing, Mr <laughs> McKenzie. Uh, but it is what it is, I suppose, is, is, is how I could respond that because there's a mixed economy and there's mixed ownership of our ports and the infrastructure, some of it's ageing, some of it's newer, some of the proposals are very exciting in terms of how it's refreshed, but uh, largely at the moment um, it's meeting the commercial demand that's there, but there's potential to do much more. So where the private sector can get involved, uh, or where the public sector can get involved in the private <coughs> sector, um, we will, and there are proposals, you'll be familiar with them because of your background and your involvement with the National Planning Framework for further developments around ports and harbours as well. Um, trust ports will increasingly, through what we've discussed earlier, have that um, security. There'll be further investment in Scottish Government's infrastructure uh, as well, through our agents, through our operating agents. And for the private sector, as the economy picks up, there'll be further opportunities. But through trying to encourage more freight to our ports and harbours as well, then it should uh, assist with growth. And the elements around internationalisation have also to be welcomed, because ports and harbours are not just used by freight, but by the uh, wider passenger ferries as well. And as we increasingly focus on internationalisation, then there's a, a potential for growth there um, too. But we wouldn't propose to go back retrospectively to have absolute consistency with all our ports and harbours, you know, to make them all the same in terms of classification or ownership, because they've all evolved through their own histories and their own infrastructure over the years, and um, they're largely uh, autonomous. Thank you, Minister, because that uh, leads me neatly on to the next question, uh, because the committee, uh, in the course of the inquiry, visited a few European ports and learned that in Europe public ownership models are commonplace. Um, can the Scottish Government seek or find some way to obtain some of the benefits of more direct public involvement in port management, uh, given the, this um, uh, quite wide and differing model of port ownership in Scotland? Well, at this stage, I'm not entirely sure that going back to all the existing ports and harbours and somehow tinkering with their governance arrangements will mean a step change in how we do business in our ports and harbours. I understand the European experience, but the, the nature of ports and harbours in Scotland and the, and the rest of the UK is, is somewhat uh, different. And as long as our, you know, there's the necessary regulation and all the environmental and the economic and the planning and the technical orders, and I believe all of that is in place, then they are regulated. But their models are all different between... Uh, private sector, the trust model and local authority led, but in all of it there is that uh, overarching uh, accountability to, to abide within the regulations that are laid out, some of which I touched upon earlier, say around the uh, harbour empowerment orders or the harbour revision orders where people want to change and, and have control of the, uh, the harbour uh, areas. There's also further potential through the Crown Estate, just in a separate matter that you'll be interested in, on the Crown Estate as it's transferred to Scotland and how local communities can access the benefits of the foreshore and the 12 nautical miles out as well. So there, there is more room for community engagement in areas such as Crown Estate and, 
and uh, uh, some of the uh, harbour areas in the foreshore uh, there. So I'm aware of the European experience, but we are where we are, and I don't propose to retrospectively go back and tinker with the existing governance arrangements of uh, the harbour and the ports, other than the tinkering that I suggested this morning that you seem to, as a committee, support, which you require, which you agree is, is, uh, appear to agree is, is necessary uh, right. for the reasons I've given. Thank you. I think that's uh, pretty uh, clear. Um, the, one of the issues that's come up uh, has been the, the need for increased port dimensions. Um, uh, 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 and, and, and there are two aspects to this, one of which is the potential for a deep water port and schemes have been talked about uh, for Hunterson and uh, Scapa Flow. Um, and that, there's a further issue about increased depth for, for feeder ports, um, uh, including the, uh, in, in order to cater for the kind of international trend of larger, larger boats, uh, larger feeder vessels. Um, so there's been a proposal to deepen Grangemouth um, and also the container port at Resyth. How is the Scottish Government ensuring that Scotland doesn't lose its connection to container shipping because of a lack of port development? And how can the Scottish Government ensure that Teesport, for instance, doesn't become Scotland's port due to its proactive development strategy that hasn't really been matched in Scotland? Well, having fallen out with David Stewart this morning, I don't want to fall out with Mike McKenzie as well, because you have missed out, of course, a very important container facility at Greenock, which of course is a deep water um, port facility that you would want to acknowledge, uh, I'm sure. So that, that facility is uh, there. The Scottish Government will do whatever we can to support the uh, commercial propositions that may come from Hunterston uh, or Recife or indeed from Scapa Flow. All are identified in the various strategic documents. Our agencies would support them in terms of uh, progressing them as appropriate and give whatever support is required. So I don't think that we would lose that um, opportunity, but crucially they have to be uh, operator-led, private sector-led, in which we will be supportive. Can I come in on that point, uh, Minister? One of the criticisms that we've heard of ports in Scotland is um, they have a, a monopolistic position within the market. They are not pushed, if you like, to invest in modern uh, facilities. Um, particularly, I think, uh, I'd be fair to say, the, the Grangemouth uh, facility uh, in the fourth. Um, and as a consequence of that, we are losing out by way of container traffic, etc., to the likes of uh, Teesport in the northeast of England, where they seem to have a much more dynamic um, management of that facility. So there is there is um, concerns that, uh, given the, the ownership structure that we, we have inherited, that it's not actually serving the interests of our um, trade, uh, our international trade, in Scotland, and of course, international trade is one of the key areas that the Scottish Government wants to um, uh, grow our economy. So, how uh, is that on? Is that on your radar? And is there something that you could uh, do, albeit that it's a privately owned facility, to improve matters in that direction? I think that's a, a fair analysis, convener. The difficulty is in what's the answer to the question when the sector is largely a uh, private sector and therefore simply throwing government money at it would not be the right approach or complete nationalisation would probably not be the right approach either because it doesn't address the basic issue of commercial viability. And it's that commercial viability that's so important. So where there is demand, it can lead to a proposal, expansion or investment in itself, but you're right, I wouldn't want private sector developers to have run down facilities that aren't attractive and can't service the market. Well, they'll become commercially unviable themselves and indeed you know, become uh, at risk of various other regulations as well. So you're right in the sense that we can't push the private sector into uh, 
developments. It is about encouraging and stimulating growth, and we're doing that. Exports from Scotland are up. There's great developments around food and drink uh, exports as well. So we are creating the conditions for economic growth that should in turn, and investing in infrastructure, that should in turn lead to, to propositions uh, for, for further private sector infrastructure spend. And where there's collaboration and partnerships approach, we can also leverage in public sector money. And I've given examples of tax incremental finance. There's the uh, other financial models that we've got. It can be supportive and our agencies can be supportive. But what we won't do is build a big white elephant in the hope that somebody comes and occupies it and trades with us and uses it. Where we've spent government grant before is to unlock economic potential, work with our partners, get collaboration and make a business model work. And that's what you should do with public money. And then there's a return for the public purse as well, rather than necessarily, as some have suggested, build a huge, big, deep water public sector port and hope that it'll be all right in the night. That would be expensive and particularly um, risky. So our balanced approach, I think, is the right one. But in terms of pushing people where there has been a risk, and, and maybe you'll come to it in terms of um, free or ferries, is the Recife Zeebrugger route, where the government has done everything in our ability to sustain that route uh, in a range of different ways, some of which are potentially commercially sensitive. But it's an example where we have been able to sustain and put pressure on uh, the private sector to keep delivering a service. But what that has is commercial demand. It's other factors like European sulphur directives that have been the issue rather than lack of demand, which emphasises my point, does it not, that commercial viability has to be at the crux eh, of any, any decision and any strategy here. So I know that's quite a complex answer, convener, um, but it feels to me as if, say, wholesale nationalisation would not be the answer because it doesn't address viability. OK, um, well, it's perhaps an area that we, we can follow up with you, but uh, there are other options to wholesale nationalisation in terms of controlling monopolies, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, Mike, you want to pick up some of these well, points? Well, I think really the... Uh, thank you, Convener, but the, the, the Minister has kind of anticipated my, my next question, so um, I think he's given a pretty clear answer. Um, and... Uh, I, 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 I think the question I would therefore ask is just to see if the Minister was willing to consider um, uh, whether or not what Mr Ingram says, that there perhaps is some middle ground that may uh, result in uh, some uh, investment that seems apparent to the committee from its visits that may be needed uh, um, in those ports owned by and operated by fourth ports, because it seems as if that in particular model of ownership is perhaps not delivering the necessary level of investment. And, uh, but that, that, that's something I'm sure the Minister will, will, will think about. I'm more than happy to hear the committee's deliberations and findings on the issue of control and, and monopolies. Of course, no one port authority has a monopoly over the whole country. It's just they may have absolute control over the port or ports that they control, and the private sector may have choices. And part of what we can do is ensure that yeah, the infrastructure is right um, as well. Um, but you could come to a point where you, we in public sector invest in infrastructure to a port, and then the port's no longer in operation. Now, there are examples uh, of that. And so that can be quite a challenge, but if you've got further um, evidence around um, how to tackle the issue of maybe a more intransigent port authority, um, I'm all ears. OK. Are you finished? Thank you, Convener. Yeah. OK. Can we, can we move on now to freight grant schemes? Uh, Minister Dave. Thank you, Convener. I'm sure the Minister has looked very carefully at the evidence we have gathered uh, over many meetings about um, freight facilities grants, which I've got particular interest in. I think it's fair to summarise, Convener, that generally witnesses have been very positive about freight facilities grants, um, and the basis of that allows uh, modal shift. However, there were some issues around issues about them being a bit inflexible and how um, it would be useful in terms of take-up if there was a less complex application process and make them more, more effective generally. Can I have the Minister's general views uh, around that in terms of how you make freight facilities grants generally more accessible? 
Okay, I think it's a fair question. Some of your witnesses have said that the process is complex and others have said that uh, it's not. Uh, so I think there's been a mixed bag of evidence in, in, in that respect. So if there's any room for improvement, I'm happy to look at it. My general sense is, though, that because of due diligence, because of state aid rules, because of regulatory complexities, all of which we are bound by, there are some necessary evils in the whole bureaucratic process. But that said, some of the complexities around accessing the grants might be about the proposition itself, might be around who's involved, how do you reach critical mass, how do you get collaboration. Are we back to a position where it's a grant to one body or is it about unlocking a facility mm. for many? I think all of that is quite complex. Um, and therefore, our systems, I think, are broadly fine. If there's room for improvement, I'm happy to look at, again, our grant uh, award and assessment and application systems. But I think of, as much of this lies in the complexity of the bids uh, as it does in the process itself. But, of course, I want the process to be mm. as streamlined as possible. And officials can give examples of a quick turnaround in decisions where the applications have been competent and comprehensive and have met all the criteria. Mm. So there's certainly a willingness to spend the resources, but it has to be appropriately spent, as mm. the members uh, would expect. Mm. I mean, f you know, for example, our advisors tell us that there hasn't been any successful applications for freight facilities grants since 2011. And in fairness, because I'm sure the Minister's got this in front in this brief, uh, I think there was a waterborne grant scheme application in Corpac for £900,000. Um, I'm sure we're all on the same page in this, that we do want to see that increased. Um, we took evidence from the Chief Executive of Controls Harbour, who was successful. And if memory serves me correctly, Convener, uh, he told the committee that he, he employed a consultant to make sure that he ticked all the boxes to get that application in hand. So it is a bit of a worry. One of the, some of the suggestions are that there's a great involvement of public bodies, such as RTPs and local authorities, um, and that there's um, help for existing freight facilities, such as in Coat Bridge, where you know, we took evidence about the inability to fund the new cranes that, that, that they desperately need. I do take the point, because of some experience with European funding, about the issues around uh, state aid. Um, but what would your response be to in involving more local authorities and organisations like HITRANS, who do a great job in this particular area? I think um, local authorities and regional transport partnerships are in a pretty good position to be an honest broker and maybe assess local need and what can unlock the most economic potential. So I think they certainly should get more involved. And I want to reach out more from the transport brief and, and be more engaged with local authorities on this and, and other uh, uh, agendas. So I think that's a fair, fair point. And also a fair representation of... Uh, grant success, that Waterborne's been uh, more successful in some years than others uh, at, at rail, and um, the freight facilities grant itself is as described. But on hearing that lack of spend, as you would expect me to do as Minister, I've investigated it and probed it, and there were some rather substantial bids that were forming at the time and withdrawn by the applicant, not because of anything the government was doing, but because of their own commercial interests, maybe proposals that they no longer wanted to proceed with yet and are still to come. And as I'm sure you'll appreciate, when these significant and credible bids come in, we start to assume that if that's successful, what does that mean to the budget? Now, there were, there were two in particular. They may be commercially sensitive, so if, if you don't mind, I won't say who they were, but they're an example of bids that were coming forward. They were progressing well, and because of the business decisions there, they decided not to progress with them. So it's just an example of there is interest in the grant support. We weren't able to spend it, but as Mr Stewart would expect, I did not let a penny pass from the, uh, uh, what I had available to me as Transport Minister and was able to spend it in other um, responsible areas. What I've done uh, for awareness uh, in this financial year is reprofile the Future Transport Fund uh, you recall the first debate I had as Transport Minister was to support active travel and across the Chamber there's requests for more money for active travel, so that's exactly what I've done through the Future Transport Fund uh, and that's been uh, welcomed. Now that has an impact on the, 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 some of the grants for freight, but if there is demand we'll look sympathetically at it, but I think um, in supporting new applications and the applications that were in before, we will be able to, to, to give awards uh, in due course, especially if we 
have further streamlining that may be a consequence of your um, findings. So I'm not concerned or alarmed by the lack of spend, having looked into it, having been assured the reasons for it, and then being aware of applications that may come in the near future. I hope that answers thank, your question. Thank the Minister for um, uh, his comments. Just a couple of quick questions, uh, Convener. Um, you, the Minister has already mentioned the Resistors of Brugger Ferry Service. Um, in the previous session, uh, the Transport Committee at the time actually did um, a visit which involved us uh, using that service when it was super fast. And I think strategically it's a very, very important um, route. Uh, you have mentioned that clearly there was a lot of government support for this. Um, where do you see the future of that service going? And is there any likelihood of further government support um, in terms of maintaining that crucial service for freight um, and for passengers? In terms of Resife, uh, yes. Seabrugger, yes. Um, the, there are no current proposals that I'm aware of in terms of passenger. It's only, yes, uh, there's, so there's no bids, there's no progress there. But in terms of maintaining and sustaining the current um, freight uh, facility, government's doing everything we can. And there are a range of options that are being explored at the moment. We've sustained, saved through dialogue, um, the service so far, and we hope that that continues to be the case. We hope it continues to have a future. If there's any change to that scenario, I'll certainly report that back to the committee. But there are current live discussions about what kind of support package the government may be able to <coughs> offer, but they've had constant access to our officials to, yeah. to unlock any deal that, that may allow the, the service to continue. And to be clear, again, that relates to freight. There is no request for support around passenger um, services. Yeah, th thank you. And then my final question is about um, European funding, which I'm, I've been particularly uh, interested in um, over the years. Certainly from witnesses, uh, there was a sort of trend to say that they felt that other European countries actually got more bangs for the buck in terms of accessing European uh, funding. Um, and you'll know I've recently put a question to you, which you answered recently uh, about this. I mean, for example, uh, the utilising the sort of Marco Polo funding, the Motorway of the Seas funding, and 10T funding, which incidentally I also raised in connection uh, with the new force crossing. Um, which I thought was a really useful uh, use, use of that funding. What, what's the Minister's pers perspective on that? Uh, uh, I realise it takes more than it takes two to tango in these things, uh, but clearly there is substantial European funding out there. Do you feel that the uh, organisations are a bit slow accessing that, or again, is it about bureaucracy and the key problem of trying to get match funding uh, in order to access European funding? We would want to, to do even more in terms of accessing uh, European funding through our, our offices and uh, our agencies. And sometimes you're right, it might be about the operator, maybe not exploring all the, the options first. Um, but where we see an opportunity, we take it. We try and maximise funding for our own proposals and for partner proposals um, as well. So explore all European funding opportunities, be proactive. Uh, around it. I'm not sure about the perception, though, that our, other countries do better. Uh, I'm not sure about that perception because we've got quite a good record generally of attracting European funding, but we'll be focusing specifically on further infrastructure spend. And of course, there's a great deal of work with local authorities as well in terms of accessing uh, European resources. So we'll certainly be uh, proactive in trying to access uh, those resources for infrastructure spend in Scotland. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Okay, David, could I ask James to move on to Thank other you. subjects? Thank you, Convener. Um, during the course of the inquiry, we visited a local consolidation centre run by the Binnenstad Service in the Netherlands, myself and uh, Mr Stewart. Uh, and also we, we've heard the work being led by Tactran to assist the development of similar urban consolidation schemes in uh, Perth and Dundee. Could you tell me, you've already spoke about the last mile and you've spoke about uh, collaboration between yourselves and uh, the local authorities. Could you tell me how you're working with local authorities in matters such as increased night time deliveries and the role of consolidation facilities to improve the quality and reduce the emissions of urban freight? And I note that uh, there was, in Glasgow during the Commonwealth Games, there was a, a night delivery service which seemed to be a great success. And the cooperative were part of that and seemed to be keen to continue in something like that. In addition to the quite comprehensive answer I thought I gave earlier around transport governance, partnerships uh, and engagement, in addition to all of that, we have the freight quality partnerships as well, and they're at a local level, and they can discuss those kind of matters and, and much more. 
around what issues might be relevant at a more regional or, or, or local level. And the example you give around uh, night time deliveries is, is one good example of how they could discuss that with a, with a uh, local focus. So as well as the infrastructure I've discussed earlier, um, I think they could um, carry out some of that partnership work and discussion, and certainly Transport Scotland will, will play their uh, part within that, and so too will the regional transport partnerships. Okay. Uh, <coughs> further to that, the, the, the need for freight operators to collaborate was raised by witnesses, and you did discuss something like that earlier on with, with the convener, but in addition to the commercial difficulties that sometimes prevent this, examples including sharing empty containers and joint co consolidation centres, how can the Scottish Government seek to aid such collaboration? We would certainly support collaboration because although I have pointed out that it is private sector led and, and most companies will have a clear focus on their product, uh, their profit, their employees, their service, I understand that, but we will get bigger gains and uh, bigger, um, bigger results for them, better results for them indeed if there is uh, collaboration and that is why our action plan, our strategy from 2006 onwards has supported uh, collaboration. How can government compel it? Well, we can't compel it. But any grants that we use or policies that we produce should certainly encourage uh, collaboration. Uh, equally, collaboration within the public sector uh, is also to be uh, welcomed, and we will support the Freight Transport uh, Association around their work streams in this um, area as well, and any other stakeholders or representative bodies that might have an interest in promoting uh, freight. But I agree absolutely with Mr Dorman around the, uh, the need for collaboration. Okay, well, hopefully something will come out of the report that we'll be able to move forward with. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I move on to um, other matters, uh, Minister? The Scottish Government has set challenging carbon emission targets for the country. How can it ensure that the freight industry makes a contribution to carbon emission reductions? I think there's a, there's a range of things uh, that we can do as part of that, that package. Of course, it is to be welcomed that we've got the most challenging climate change targets in the world, and the government's produced a, a host of policies to take that forward. But if you take um, road use, we want to decarbonise road use. Now, that will affect individual cars more than freight, of course, because of the nature of, of, of HGVs. Um, but, but that will contribute to, to lower emissions. We've launched a, an air quality um, consultation as well uh, around emissions, and that will have an impact on transport policies uh, clearly. There are, there's further work around uh, regulation and education of drivers driving more uh, efficiently. There's a modal shift issue that we've spent some time on and trying to get traffic off the road onto rail uh, and, and waterborne uh, options um, as well. Sometimes there will be a, a reduced need uh, to travel as well, but in terms of uh, products um, efficiency and taking carbon out of the, of the system uh, will be uh, encouraged, and we will use all the, the research uh, that, that we can to inform that work. In 2013, we published Switched On Scotland, which was a roadmap to widespread adoption of plug-in vehicles as well, and this set out our plan to drive forward the uptake of electric vehicles in Scotland, as I have described, in terms of the transition to low-carbon economy and the decarbonisation. And that would include um, vans. And we will continue to use our grant support to encourage that uh, modal shift. So these are some of the examples I would cite uh, in terms of that environmental policy. Okay. Do you actually have targets for, in, in that sense for freight as opposed to passenger traffic? It is more um, focused around the levels of emissions, but I would want to check up on specific um, targets in terms of you know, number of journeys. Um, so if you, take, if you take our normal transport um, for passengers, um, clearly we can count the number of trips or uh, journeys used by public transport as opposed to individual cars. When it comes to freight, I think the bigger gain is in volume of emissions. But, of course, one of the inputs from that would be uh, how many journeys we can transfer from road to rail or road mm. uh, to sea or, or the volume of goods that could be transported in, in that mode. Well, I think we'd be interested to perhaps get well, some more... Right we'll back, convener to the committee with more detail on any targets that may be relevant, as you have requested. Thank you. 
Can I move now to policy matters? And in terms of policy, some respondents have mentioned in evidence that an updated Scottish Government freight policy was required. Um, how would the Scottish Government see a new policy addressing some of the, the issues uh, that have been raised during this inquiry? Well, notwithstanding what I said earlier about refreshing the national transport strategy, about refreshing the rail freight uh, policy, because some elements have changed, always looking at the criteria for grant. And, you know, the government's position in our economic strategy was only published, I think it was in March uh, this year as well. So I think it shows that the government's economic transport strategies moves as, as time moves on. So I'm not convinced we need an overarching new policy, but maybe we require further refinement along the lines of uh, what um, your committee may recommend uh, that we do. But largely, I think the, pardon the pun, but direction of travel is, is in the right direction. Um, it, it's fine. Um, but I don't think we need a whole comprehensive um, review of our uh, policy, but certainly refresh uh, what's uh, necessary. Okay. Um, and my final question is with regards to the planning system. Uh, how can the Scottish Government ensure that the planning system functions effectively with regards to the needs of freight transport in Scotland, particularly with respect to actually delivering the schemes that are listed in the National Planning Framework 3? Well, convener, it was fine when I left it uh, <laughs> as planning minister. That's now a matter for Marco uh, Biagi. Um, but the, the national policies are in line with supporting freight and, of course, um, rail and harbour uh, and port uh, investment, as well as the city strategy, the town strategy, and supporting our rural areas as well, all to unlock economic growth, sustainable economic growth. What's been described sometimes by the private sector in the past is a disconnect between fantastic policies and implementation on the ground. That's not a criticism, it's just the, the nature of the beast in terms of uh, local decisions. So I think I would say this, wouldn't I, that the, the, the planning framework is sound. I think the policies are clear, they were described as such, they're supportive uh, to, to freight. Our investment strategy will, will back up those, those planning policies. Uh, and, and certainly, Scottish planning policy should be uh, supportive. But as all members know, it is the implementation of the policies that matter. And for that reason, uh, I'm sure your, your uh, findings will help reinforce any of the perceived weaknesses around implementation at the uh, local level. But some of the partnership arrangements that we've put in place will give me the opportunity to emphasise the point around freight when I meet uh, partners such as COSLA and local authorities and the planning authorities through the relevant um, uh, uh, ministers. But I am convinced we've set out clarity and positivity in terms of economic growth and infrastructure uh, as it relates to freight. Okay. Linda, you wanted to... Yes. Um, please, Minister, a very general question. And I understand that this is an inquiry into freight, but I was struck by... Uh, K Walls of Freightliners comment about uh, joined up thinking um, right across the board and she talked about Eurocentral for example and saying that when the, the rail freight service opened there um, she feels there was an opportunity missed and that there was no passenger service put in because of the congestion on, on the roads passing Eurocentral and I, I, because I use that road a lot I know exactly what she means I'm aware that that's a long, long time ago, but I just wondered if there's any scope at all at some point for strategically looking at uh, some of that stuff in regard to freight and then in the overall picture, tying it up with general people movement. I, I would agree with that, that criticism and that, that analysis and that, that, you know, that, that big economic uh, development isn't particularly sustainable because it didn't have a real yeah. connection as exactly as you've described. So if people want to get transport, I, do, I, and I have to say, I don't think bus connections are particularly brilliant no. um, either if you've used public transport to get to the, to the nearest station. So I think it's a fair criticism. Uh, but of course, it's not a, 
it's not a new project. It's not born from the current or, or even fairly recent transport or development policies that, that we have, because that would focus on sustainable and active travel. It would focus on um, accessibility. It would focus on a town centre first principle. It would focus on joined up communities and clear strategies uh, around that. So I would like to think that we would have a different approach. Now, we are where we are. It's still a great business location. Of course it is. Um, but in terms of accessibility, then different decisions, better decisions maybe could have been made. But let's not leave it at that. Of course, there are um, proposals for, um, well, we'll have the new Borders Railway. And if there are further bids, and that's my point throughout all of this, because it's private sector led, if there's a private sector bid, then government could be supportive around further uh, investment. There's a range of financial tools I suggested earlier, such as city deals, such as tax incremental finance, where local economic potential can be unlocked. It doesn't just always have to be the government coming and doing something, but simply creating the conditions in which entrepreneurs, businesses, local authorities or other operators can take forward a, a bid to improve um, infrastructure or that sense of location. So we have the, the new stations or the, uh, the stations fund as well, where you know, there may be existing rail routes, routes and people may want to look at enhanced stations as well as the other grants that I've identified. So I think the analysis is fair, but around policy reassurance, all those considerations around transport, accessibility, sense of place, are built into, hardwired into current planning and investment policies in a way that was clearly not the case before. So in terms of the partnerships that you would have, there's much greater partnership uh, working between government agencies and the private sector now than I think there ever was before, where you might have had a you know, a government-led department or agency simply carrying out a mm -hmm. development proposal. There's far more collaboration than that has to be um, welcomed. Thank you. Yeah. Do any other members have questions for the Minister? Uh, Minister, do you want to uh, have any final words on this matter? No, I think I've said <laughs> everything said that enough. should be said and maybe a bit more can be enough. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, can I thank uh, the witnesses for coming along this morning and, and answering our questions. And uh, we shall now pause uh, the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table. Thank you very much.
Um, can we can we move to the final item for today, which is consideration of a negative instrument, the Housing Scotland Act 2006 Repayment Charge and Discharge Amendment Order 2015. Um, can members refer to paper six, which summarises the purpose and prior consideration of this instrument? Um, so we, the committee will now consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on the instrument. Members should note there have been no motions to annul have been received in relation to the instrument. So can I invite comments from members? Do we have any comments? No comments. So is the committee agreed it doesn't wish to make any recommendation in relation to the instrument? Agreed. Okay. Well, that concludes today's committee business. Um, so I now close this meeting. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for the 20th of May. So for some reason or other, we don't have meetings next week or, or the following week. Um, in terms of uh, perhaps we could get a little bit of information on, I take it that was the last witness session we ha were having on the inquiry. Um, so.